There it is. All right. We're live for the last show of this week. Super excited to chat with our guest today. We're going to talk about sex workers in polyamory and living shame free. This is going to be a lot of fun. Tune in. Here we go. Practicing polyamory. Real life perspectives from the imperfect people of polyamory. The mission of the Practicing Polyamory podcast is to provide a platform for all of the real-life, flawed humans that practice polyamory so that we might all learn from one another and grow as a community. Enjoy the show. All right, all right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this beautiful Wednesday. Before we jump in and chat with our awesome guest today, I want to quickly remind everybody that we are open for open for questions. If you have any questions about your relationships or if there's a specific topic that you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, slide into my DMs. Follow us on all social media platforms, especially Facebook and Instagram. That's where I'm most active. Follow us at Practicing Polyay. Send me a message. <clears throat> Would love to cover whatever topic that you're interested in. Don't forget to also subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, wherever it is that you download the podcast. And remember, this show is recorded live. Look up there. Join us for the live recording and you can get your questions answered live on the spot. And as always, I want to remind you, if you're listening to this podcast, you are a welcome guest to be on the show. We're here to share stories and I want to get as many voices as possible to speak here because I know that the more stories we hear, the more representation we'll have, the more others will see us in themselves and the more we can strengthen our community. So go to practicingpolyamory.com and sign up today. All right, everybody, that's my spiel. And now... On to the best part of the show, introducing our awesome guest. Our guest today has an incredible and remarkable story. From homeschool to college, from psychology and business degrees to marketing and office management, from drug and alcohol addictions to sobriety and working as a high-end escort, and now as a therapist, relationship coach, and certified sexologist, her life experiences taught her one thing above all. There is no need for a life filled with shame. This amazing guest has a knack for making people feel safe to explore their shame without feeling judged. Her personal experience in moving past that crippling emotion and realizing her full potential as a joyful being is a powerful gift that she is able to share with her clients so that they too can live happy, shame-free lives. Whether we experience shame about gender, race, sexual orientation, fantasies, socioeconomic status, or anything else, the results are the same. Lower self-esteem and distrust in ourselves and our relationships. Our guest today can help us overcome that. Joining us today from the shame-free zone out of Grass Valley, California, welcome to the show, Veronica Monet. <laughs> Wow, right. James, I have to tell you, the only time that I have had that illustrious of an intro was on Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect show. So wow. I'm really Bill, impressed. I, I, did you just <laughs> compare me to Bill Maher? Wow. I, I say, hold up. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blushing here. <laughs> Yeah, you're pretty good. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Thank you. And so are you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, no, I mean, you are the, the guest of honor here. Uh, I'm, I'm here to highlight you and everything that you do. And I totally screwed up and didn't ask you this before the show. So I'm going to ask you right now, uh, if we want to follow you on social media or find you online, where would we do that? Well, James, I confess I don't have all my uh, social media memorized, but I know over on Instagram, it's the shame free zone. I think there's a bunch of dashes, uh, lowercase dashes between each word, the dash shame free dash zone. And then um, on Facebook, you can find my um, personal site, which is just for uh, Veronica Monet. And then over on the uh, business page, it's the shame free zone. So pretty easy to find me. Actually, if you just put the shame free zone in, it's going to come in up all over the place. You'll find my YouTube too, which is Veronica Monet. Boom. Perfect. So <laughs> I did that, you know, a little bit backwards. I usually do that before the show, but hey, here we are. Uh, well, let's just jump right in. Let's talk about living in the shame free zone. You have 
absolutely a story. I mean, <laughs> wow. There's so much that you've been through. And uh, the one that, that I wanted to kind of uh, touch on here, especially was the high-end escort and sex work service. There are a lot of our listeners out there, a lot of our uh, polyamorous community that also are sex workers. And I imagine that there's a lot of shame involved, you know, and, and things that they're struggling with. So I want to ask, you know, just kind of get your perspective, a little bit of your history and, uh, and how you got to where you are today. Well, it's, it's interesting. I'm sure it's pretty shocking for my, my mom because um, she raised me in a very strict Christian, Christian cult. And uh, she always told me to save my kisses for my husband. That was, and also <laughs> wash quickly down there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, okay. So, and I was grow. I I grew up homeschooled. I I had no contact with the outside world except the cult. So consequently, mm. I didn't get exposed to much around sex. I never even masturbated until I got to college. Wow. Thank God I went to an actual college. My mother wanted me to send go to the uh, church college, and I just it would have been more nightmares. But mm -hmm. uh, but I went to an actual college and I took human sexuality and I found out, oh, masturbation is a good thing. So um, I started nice. trying, to learn, try, tried to learn how to do that. And I'm telling you, it didn't come easy. I, I think I had too many layers of shame and, mm -hmm. and um, kind of brainwashing to get past. So um, I became very rebellious. I left the cult. I started having a lot of promiscuous sex. I had some bad experiences. Um, I, I was raped once in college. And then after college, I um, started working as an ma um, office manager or actually a department manager for a telecommunications firm. And one of my coworkers raped me when we were out drinking. So um, I had a lot of negative experiences around sexuality. I was also abused by my father when I was a little girl. And that was pretty common in the cult that I was raised in. It wasn't like part of their doctrine, but the founder had actually molested his daughter. So here I'm coming from this background of a lot of sexual shame and punishment and rules and rigidity and regulation. And yet the subtext is this abuse of children. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that by the time I get to college, I was very disillusioned and the hypocrisy was, it just reeked. So um, my journey was obviously fraught, but being homeschooled, I really didn't, I wasn't streetwise. I didn't know how to protect myself or read situations or read people. And it kind of made me a sitting duck in some ways, but so that's the journey. And then I, 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 um, I became a rape counselor um, and um, also a domestic violence counselor. I was very politically active early mm -hmm. on. And, and then I discovered that I was bisexual. Oh. And that was very disturbing to me. I actually, it just went against my training and all uh -huh. of this, the, the homophobia I had been inculcated with. But it became really apparent to me that th I was hardwired that way and there wasn't a darn thing I was going to be able to do about it. And I got introduced to this woman that I just thought she was beautiful. She was the centerfold and she wanted a few beauty pageants. <laughs> and uh, okay, so that tells you a little bit about my taste in women. So, um, <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> well, I, mean, you know, since, since then, I got involved in the queer rights movement and, and, um, and mm -hmm. I, I broadened my horizons a little bit. I've, I've had crushes on women who had mustaches and were full blown butches. So, nice. um, but anyway, first girlfriend centerfold and she was married, had three kids drove a Mercedes, lived in a beautiful house in the uh, IBM district in um, the Bay Area, which was an expensive neighborhood at the time. And she was working as an escort. Now, dun, dun, dun. I was a diehard feminist. So I thought this <clears throat> poor woman, if she had a college diploma like me, she sure wouldn't be doing this kind of work. This is so degrading. And so I hung out with her, made love with her, and thought, maybe I'll rescue her. Mm. 
about... the white knight syndrome oh yeah yeah oh boy i've got i have that masculine spirit. <laughs> i really do i'm cisgender female but i have a masculine side turns out after a few months of dating her i was like maybe she could rescue me <laughs> at the time i'm working as a marketing representative for a radio station in santa cruz and the boss is a sexist he's pimping mm. me out to clients he's saying you take that account because he likes a really good looking pair of legs and I, uh, it's for 10 percent commission and sure enough i go and i woo the account and the guy leads me on leads me on and then asks me out on a date and I just, the hypocrisy again was the big thing for me and the double standard. It just, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked her to teach me. Now I want to, I want to stress, I had, I graduated with honors from Oregon State University. Mm -hmm. I had a degree in psychology and a minor in business administration. I had been working in corporate America for seven years. I had been an office manager, a department manager, and a marketing representative. But here I am asking this high school graduate who is kicking six-figure income, please teach me. <laughs> <laughs> so she was the one that rescued you. She was. And the first thing she did, first of all, she refused. <laughs> she said, no, no I, don't, I don't want that kind of responsibility. <laughs> And I said, well, then I'm going to do it on my own. And she knew that was trouble. She's like, mm -hmm. no, 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 this is not like, this, this is the one of the misnomers. Yes, there is survival sex in the, in the sex business. Absolutely. But the, the, the people who are really making a, a, a large income, they've really got to be really entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And there's so yeah. much to know. And that was such an eye opener for me. So she said, okay, okay, I'll teach you because I don't want you to hurt yourself. Right. And uh, I apprenticed to her for nine months. And during that time, she trotted me down to get my federal ID tax number. So I'd pay taxes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's kind of uncommon um, in the United States. But she started me off right. And it really paid off. About 12 years later, I got audited and I was good. Nice. I paid my taxes the whole time. Nice. So um, the biggest thing she taught me was how to connect with my intuition. So here I am. I've been raised in a, a patriarchal society, which is all about logic. I, I loved taking um, philosophy classes, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, if A plus B equals C, all that stuff. I was way into that. And here comes this woman and she's teaching me about intuition, which I had none of at the time. I really, it had been trained out of me. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know how to tune into my inner voice. So it's just like this introduction to this whole feminine world that I wasn't aware of. And when I say feminine, I'm not talking about gender here. I'm just saying that the, the feminine has been suppressed in our current culture. Right. So, Getting t in touch with that is like, wow, you know, my body does actually know some things. I kind of get an idea of when somebody's safe and when they're not. Yeah, yeah. And the biggest risk, I mean, we were working high end in Silicon Valley. The biggest risk was really the cops. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they sometimes play dirty. Uh, they try to get sexual favors for free under threat of, right. of you know, jail time. So... After a while, I really got good at spotting the cops on the telephone. Um, and even, you know, if, God forbid, they got through my filters and showed up in person. So um, it's in the body language, by the way, for anybody who's curious. <laughs> <laughs> tips, tips. <laughs> oh, I got to be careful about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't teach anybody how to be a prostitute because that's considered a conspiracy charge. So I never, oh, nice. never do. Nice. Um, my book actually it came out in 2005 is called sex secrets of escorts. Everybody thinks that's a how to, and it's not, well, it is, it's a how to for housewives about how to seduce your husband. Oh, nice. And that's the publisher, by the way, I, I, I probably wouldn't have targeted housewives, but they're like, Hey, talk to the housewives. And <laughs> I'm like, what? I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> nice well played well played so veronica i i gotta ask okay so so you've you've gone through all of these um 
all of these things in your life, you, 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 you've, had these traumatic experiences you were you know raised in a cult you uh you know even had to battle the the shame of you know of discovering your bisexuality and and deprogramming uh you know all of that so you know when it comes to getting started and and getting past that shame part how did you deconstruct that? Like, what were some of the things, what were some of the the pillars that you yes. really had to break down to be able to live a shame-free, joyful life? It. Thank you. Great question. So here's the thing. First thing was a rape survivor, incest survivor, cult survivor. I needed a lot of therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I, I, was in, I was in therapy all the time. And frankly, all these years later, I still do therapy. So I think it's a great adjunct to any healthy life. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing was getting clean and sober. So I had to get off the drugs and alcohol. I mean, I could cry out my stuff in therapy all day long when I was drinking and using, and it wasn't really going to get much traction. So I had to give up my addictive patterns because they were like suppressing the healing process. Um, groups, you know, being in support groups, I found just an awesome way to get connected to a lack of shame. Cause like the person sitting next to you, their father touched them too, or they were raped too. And so you start peeling that away. It was similar with the sex industry. Um, first I'm just working with my girlfriend and then she gets arrested. Mm -hmm. So obviously somebody got through her filters. Um, <laughs> And um, they started harassing me because they were going to try to get her on a felony pimping and pandering charge oh. for the fact that we worked together. They were going to blame her, put it on her. Wow. So um, I ended up going to San Francisco, got connected to queer rights community, uh, started speaking with um, uh, the bisexual community in San Francisco, going out to the colleges and everything, marching in the gay parade. All of that stuff really does start to dismantle your shame. Mm -hmm. And I met a group of sex workers who were politically active. Um, we ended up rebirthing Coyote. Uh, Margot St. James founded Coyote back in the 70s, but by then she was off in France. And the name was just kind of sitting there. So hmm. well, together with Samantha Miller and another sex worker named Vic St. Blaze. And there was an original steering committee of about five of us, including Terry Goodson. So we started speaking out publicly. And, and uh, that is a great way to erase shame. But I'm going to tell you, there was one sex worker who had a huge impact on my shame. Her name is Cozy Fabian. And she was at the time teaching classes on sacred prostitution. So now she wasn't teaching people how to be prostitutes. That would have been against the law. She was just educating us to the ancient sacred temples. And she had gone through the original Sanskrit and she was bringing that forward for us. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing myself in a totally different way. I also started seeing the act of prostitution in a totally different way. For me, it became a spiritual path. For me, I started realizing, why is it that we look at sex as something dark and bad? Mm -hmm. Why is it that we've put it off in this corner where it's separate from our spirituality? And that duality is so indicative of Western culture. We're just not integrated. Mm -hmm. so so I really just started shifting my paradigm and I started learning about ancient goddesses. Now, it doesn't matter to me if they ever existed. They're mm -hmm. iconic. They become something that I can relate to. So my patron saint is Lilith. She's very, very rebellious. Uh, the story goes that uh, Adam wanted her to lie beneath him during sex and she insisted on being on top. Um, and uh, so she got kicked out of the Garden of Eden and went off to copulate with demons. Anyway. Because uh, she, she said, didn't want to go missionary? Sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, personally, I love missionary, but anyway. Well, uh, it's certainly not. Which is certainly more enjoyable than my average day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Nice. Yeah. So anyway, I... I, 
what I do now when I'm working with women around sexual shame, and, I, and not, not necessarily women that want to be sex workers or that are sex workers, although there's a lot of sex workers that you don't even know they're sex workers. Sometimes they're therapists mm -hmm. or, you know, doctors, whatever, and they're doing that on the side. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I am often uh, exposing them to historical information. Like, let's go back before men start getting in charge of the narrative. Now, no offense to men. I think men are just as oppressed by this system as women are. But it is a fact that a lot of feminine knowledge and wisdom and uh, was suppressed for all of us. So mm -hmm. that, you know, somebody like me was out of touch with my feminine side. Um, and obviously for a lot of young boys that are still growing up nowadays today, it's kind of getting beaten out of them that they don't get to express that part of themselves. For sure. But when, when I realized it's not always been this way, <laughs> you go to the tantric temples in India, they still have all kinds of explicit sex scenes on the outside of the temple. Hmm. And, and when you go inside some of the Celtic, um, temples, you find that it was actually shaped in. Um, like a womb. Oh. So, so why is it now that we're so allergic to the very reason any of us are here? Because if somebody hadn't had sex, you and I wouldn't be talking, James. Facts. Facts. <laughs> so that's, I mean, I'll ask you that question. You, you tell me, why is it that there's so much shame around it now? Well, there's a few different theories about that. One is the suppression of the divine feminine, if you believe in that, but you don't have to. There's also the whole idea of controlling large groups of people. You know, if you have a large herd of cattle, one of the things you're going to want to do is castrate them. Oh. Because they will be easier to, to manage. Same thing with a horse. Well, Dogs. Dogs. Yes. So with people, we don't actually castrate them. We brainwash them. And we brainwash them away from their sexuality because once an animal, which by the way, we are animals, mm -hmm. steps into their um, sexual adulthood, they've sexually matured, they are very opinionated and feisty. <laughs> it's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think we're more easily managed that way. And, and here's another thing. The original government was religion. Right. Almost all the religions have a lot of proscriptions. That means they're teaching against some mm -hmm. type of sex. And, and that immediately sets into place some kind of shame around sex. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Maybe it's against so-called sodomy or against homosexuality or right. against prostitution. The Bible is full of all kinds of kill the whore things. Yep. Um, yep. So when, when you're demonizing some aspect of sexuality in religion, it's a way of controlling the masses. It's a way of making them uh, obedient. And I really think that's the, the start of it. But then when you look at the governments, they just kind of carried that forward. Like, yeah, we're going to tell you about your sex. We're going to have laws about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you can do this, but you can't do that. Uh, and if you're polyamorous, maybe we'll take your children away from you. Right. I mean, that's, that's, so that's my answer to your question, James. How was that? <laughs> that was good. That was good. It makes perfect sense. I, I totally agree. It has a lot to do with, uh, the purity culture that does come from that first government, the religion, you know, and all of that stuff that just continues yeah. to be integrated into a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, I surrender. No, no, no. We don't want to surrender. Um, <laughs> we're going to fight. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's all, you know, That that's where I, I agree that it all it all originates from and it all comes from. So now it's a matter of dismantling that, breaking that all down and giving people permission to live without that shame. How, how does somebody go from being living in shame. I mean, even, even you from, from the yeah. cult, you know, that you came from and everything was very, very oppressed to now just being this open, free person. I mean, obviously it was a lot of time in between there, yeah. but if you're working with somebody and, and that's who they want to become and they have 
a lot of those same teachings that they're carrying, what is something that you tell them to start putting them on that path? I have to give them alternative scenarios and alternative scripts because almost every single one of us has got scripts inside of our head. They were put there by church, coach, teacher, parent, uh, peers, uh, the media, the culture mm -hmm. at large. So it, it, you have to locate them like, okay, you start to experience a sense of shame. Can you find the voice, the words that are driving that feeling? Sometimes um, you can, not always. Maybe there's pictures associated with it, but you want to like find um, the script if you can. And then I actually work with my clients to rewrite the script. And I help them locate who said it. Was that a message coming mm. from your dad, your mother, your teacher, your coach? Where did it come from? And then once you locate that, you can start talking back. You can start saying to yourself, like I had scripts from my dad that were really abusive. And I just, I developed um, what I call antidotes to his voice in my head. His voice was talking to me. And I would say things like, oh, um, you know, thanks for sharing dad. Now you can shut up. Uh, and on, you know, if I was in a really feisty move, I might say F you dad, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's like this powerful way of pushing it away and that life doesn't like a vacuum. So what am I going to replace it with? I have to have an affirmation. So one is the rebuttal and mm -hmm. the other is the affirmation. I'm pushing away the thing I don't want. I'm pulling in the thing that I do want. Nice. It is really about changing the neural programming. We all have it. I mean, I work with this a lot with the anger management, which is also something that I coach. And I'm, I'm just helping reprogram people's neural pathways because once they get established, have you ever driven home without even realizing how you got there? Oh, all the time. Okay. That's a neural pathway. It's operating without you having to be cognitively aware of it. And we have those kind of scripts that just automatically push us into shame mm -hmm. um, and a reactionary place. The other mm -hmm. thing that I do is I help sacralize people's relationship with their sexuality and their, their genitals. And when I say sacralize, it just means I don't, I don't care what your religious beliefs are, or if you're an atheist, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just looking for a way to set it apart. Humans have been setting things apart for millennia. And mm -hmm. when you set it apart, you're saying this is special. So I want to reorient people to how precious and sacred their penis, their vagina, their clitoris, their womb, every aspect of themselves, their testicles, how precious and sacred that is. And I bring in some science. I love science. Hmm. I was a nerd as a kid. Probably still am a nerd. <laughs> um, Most of us are. So I bring in science, such as the fact that we have ultrasound proof that babies are masturbating in the womb. Oh, what? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I, mind blown. That's what that was supposed to be. And I hit the mic. I know. Mic blown. Is that a shame buster or what? He, wow. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I mean, because you can only go one of two directions here. You can adhere to the religious script, which says that we're all born of sin. Mm -hmm. Or you got it. What most of us believe nowadays is that babies are innocent. Mm -hmm. I do. I think they're precious and pure. So, okay, before the baby even comes out of the womb, before it has its first breath of air, before it has its first sip of mother's milk or the bottle, it masturbated to the point of orgasm, by the way. It wasn't just down there fiddling around. It actually achieved an orgasm and then took a nice long nap. Wow. Yeah. And wow. Isn't, isn't that a beautiful affirmation of how sacred and central your sexuality really is? It is. Really. It's like, yeah. and so if we're doing that in the womb, yeah. you know, there's no reason to be ashamed of whatever our sexuality is outside yeah. that's that's amazing that's exactly. amazing so exactly. i just i just want to throw a couple of other things out there a couple of other you know potential shame triggers you know uh just around uh polyamory or homosexuality uh or you know our sex financial predicament sex work yeah. um 
you know, kind of throw some 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 things out there around those breaking down some of those shames. Uh, maybe maybe some of those rejecting uh, rejecting ideas and some affirmations. Absolutely. So, for instance, let's let's go with homosexuality and lesbianism. It occurs in nature. Oh my God! I remember my cat. Two, I had two male cats. They were going at it, and I kicked them when I was young. I was still in the cult, and I thought, "Oh, that's an abomination." Hmm. And, and I look back on that, and I think, "What a horrible thing that I was condemning something that was natural." Mm -hmm. um, so it does happen in nature, and particularly in primates, there's plenty of that. Our closest living cousin, the bonobo, is a fabulous shame buster learn about the bonobos and then while you're at it make sure you send some money to save them because they're an endangered species oh, they lovely. are absolutely the most peaceful primate on the planet they don't have any of the violence that chimpanzees have whereas chimpanzees have rape domestic violence murder war and infanticide bonobos don't have any of that the worst thing you're going to see with a bonobo is they might bite somebody's finger off when they're having an argument. That's as bad as it gets. Now, I'm not, you know, in favor of biting the fingers off, but I'm just saying for a wild animal, that's pretty good. And the key is that they have a lot of consensual sex. Oh. They're, they're very, very happy, sexy animals. Nice. Yeah. So, so nobody's trying to own the sex with the chimpanzee uses domestic violence in order to claim uh, dibs on sexual access to a female. Well, How about polyamory since this is a polyamory show? Yeah. Just smile and wave boys. Smile and wave. <laughs> That's I the bonobos. Look, when I teach classes on polyamory, I always talk about the bonobos because they're very poly. There's oh. no, no jealousy, no fighting over a mate. Everybody shares. And and there's no, no violence. So isn't that a great argument for a polyamorous world where we could actually be more peaceful? I think, too, you know, Hillary Clinton always said it takes a village to raise the children. Well, where is that village? If you are poly, you have a village. Heck, yeah. You have a group of people that are helping to raise the children. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a much healthier um, way forward as well. There, there yeah. are some statistics about communities that do not practice the kind of jealous monogamy that is the Western norm. Mm -hmm. And they have less violence. No surprise. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Sex I work. love it. Sex work. I want to, sure. give, I want to give you a different template for sex work. Healing. Healing. So many people are touch deprived right now and it, we're just coming out of a, you know, over a year of this isolating because of the pandemic, it's so important to be touched. If you don't touch a baby, it dies. Um, same thing with monkeys, by the way, we absolutely need touch and prostitution can fill that, that niche for people who may not be able to access touch. Otherwise there's also cuddle parties. But there are people who want to go see a provider and should be able to do that. And my experience of most sex workers is that they're very loving, giving people. Mm -hmm. um, and they are providing a service. They're not selling their bodies. They're providing a beautiful, healing, loving service. And, um, you know, of course, lots of people get into being a doctor for different reasons. So not every sex worker has the same script and some people are trying to survive. But for those people who are doing sex work out of survival, we want to do harm reduction for those people. We don't want to demonize them or arrest them right. or push them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about finding ways to actually help them as opposed to punish them. Here's one thing I want to say about shame. Shame never helped anything. We've got a misnomer in our Western culture. The shame is controlling the, the demons. It's holding the evil and the darkness at bay. So, of course, we shame the priest and they molest the kids. In my church, there was a lot of sexual shame and they were molesting the kids. Um, in cultures that have made pornography available, they've actually seen the rate of rape go down. I think it's really important that we stop equating shame with some way to hold what we fear at bay. 
Guilt is maybe a healthy emotion because then you'll make amends, correct your behavior. But shame, it just implodes and then people don't feel redeemable mm -hmm. or they give up on themselves and they wind up in a vicious cycle of re-perpetration. And if we really want perpetrations to stop, if we want to see a world where there's only consensual adult sexual behavior, we need to eliminate the shame and, and bring it out of the closet so we can heal it. I love it. I love it. Veronica, it has been so much fun and so enlightening to chat with you. Um, he ain't lying. <laughs> one more time <laughs> for uh, anybody who uh, wanted to work with you, uh, wants to get some help from you, wants to enter that shame-free zone. Uh, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? The best way is actually just to go to my website, theshamefreezone.com. It's I've got so many domains pointing in that you can't help but find me. VeronicaMonet.com will get you there. And um, also the exclusive partnership formula.com will get you there. Sex without shame will get you there. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, and you did mention uh, the fund or the, the 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 thing for the bonobos. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on? Anything else I that you would do. want to? I, yeah, go I, ahead. Two things. Um, I'm going to be teaching a webinar. Of, it's called After Sexual Assault, Reclaiming Your Sexual Joy. Um, I'm I'm one of the few people who's actually bringing a celebration of sex to the conversation around sexual assault. So I, wow. I hope you'll join me. Um, you can find that on my social media. I've been posting it everywhere. And that class is on July 1st. Or just email me. I'll send you the link. Um, and the other thing is you definitely want to get a copy of my exquisite partnership formula. It's a free ebook, 10,000 words, full color, gorgeous. Okay, you may not want to read it. Um, all of it, but there's some great stuff in there about asserting a firm no that pulls your partner closer to you. I developed this while I was an escort, and it was all about creating a juicy, sexually vibrant connection with very firm boundaries of what kind of touch I was available for. So. Nice. That's perfect. Well, thank you again so much, Veronica. Like I said, it's been super enlightening, super fun. Uh, and I hope that our audience got a lot out of this, especially, you know, our, our sex workers audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You're a lot of fun. This is a great program. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you as always to our live audience for tuning in today. As a reminder, when we're live, you get no commercial interruptions, but the same can't be said for those podcast downloads. So if you want to avoid the commercial interruptions, be sure to catch us live Monday through Wednesday, right here, 2.30 Pacific time, or sign up for our Patreon where you'll get access to our commercial free RSS feed and support the show. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and wherever it is that you download your podcast. If you haven't already please leave us a review we'll really appreciate it that's all we've got for y'all today as always have a nice day thank you for tuning in to the practicing polyamory podcast would you or someone in your polycule like to be a guest sign up at practicingpolyamory.com and join the conversation please support us by subscribing liking and following us on social media at practicing polya by clicking any of the affiliate links on our website or by subscribing at patreon.com slash practicing polya